I'm assuming that you would like me to reply to the, the four previous. Uh, I, I'd like to think that this is uh, against Eisenman Part A. Uh, part, it seems like this is the day. Um, I, I would like to say that the history of my history with these historical figures is in reverse order. That is, I begin with Taranyi, uh, I move to Palladio, uh, then to Piranesi, and then finally back to Alberti. And um, I would argue that um, the work is very much more unconscious than any of the uh, historical analyses uh, presented today uh, would like to ascribe. Uh, um, I certainly never had read Bloom when I started to work on Tarani in 61, because Bloom hadn't been bloomed until 1973. So I wasn't uh, involved in swerving uh, at the beginning, or maybe Bloom understood swerving from my work on Tarani. I'm not certain. Um, in any case, uh, as Colin Rowe uh, has written on several occasions, I had an epiphany when I first saw the work of Taranyi in the summer of 1961. Um, I had seen uh, the work of Taranyi only in a book by Alberto Sartoris, which was given to me by Colin Sinjin Wilson uh, in the winter of 1960 for having taken his class uh, in Cambridge in 1960 while he went, as it said, out to Yale, as if he was going out to the Wild West, uh, his first trip to the United States. In, in any case, um, I was uh, overwhelmed by seeing the work of Taranyi Cesare Catania and others in the uh, Sartoris Encyclopedia d'Architecture. Um, and uh, it was something absolutely uh, stunning for me that I could not equate with either Le Corbusier, whom I had been familiar with, nor Mies van der Rohe, also a, a subject of my undergraduate studies, and also the subject of a trip that Colin Rowe and I took uh, before the epiphany through uh, de Stijl, through Mies van der Rohe's Lange uh, and Esther's house, through the Weissenhof Siedlung with Le Corbusier, uh, etc., uh, arriving uh, in Zurich uh, to see the work uh, shown to us by Bernard Hursley. Uh, of Le Corbusier and when he was working with uh, Le Corbusier. So uh, I wandered on as we came through uh, from Switzerland to Como, uh, seeing, first of all, en passant, the Catania building in Chernobyl, which I thought was also quite stunning uh, and, and unique. But seeing the Casa del Fascio and then later in the same moments to see the Asilo Infantile, the, the um, Giuliani Frigerio, I was amazed that there was nothing of Le Corbusier or Mies uh, in this work. It was, to me, uh, totally unique, and it was something that uh, I wanted to pursue, uh, which I did partly in my dissertation. What I realized in retrospect is that I really wanted to do a dissertation on Taranyi, uh, but because of my circumstances in Cambridge, England, which was a, 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 a place of phenomenological respite uh, that was populated by Joseph Rickward, Norbert Schultz, and others, I was required to produce work on Alto and Frank Lloyd Wright in my dissertation which I now realized was a pressure put on me by circumstance rather than something that I was interested in doing. Um, there was no question because I extracted from the dissertation and produced a book on Taranyi. Now, many people would argue uh, that um, 
I uh, invented Taranyi. In fact, I would like to think I have invented myself and many other architects, Luigi Moretti, Palladio, uh, according to nothing to do with what they said or actually did, uh, but what I interpreted from them. In other words, I was engaged in what Emmanuel would call a rewriting, not a writing, but a rewriting, and not so much a swerving, but inventing the original uh, if uh, that was possible. Um, you can also look at the history now moving back from Torani, which was not conscious at the time because there was no postmodernism, but I was trying to save the Torani that I saw from someone like Bruno Zevi, who had been the only person at the time, it was not fashionable to write about uh, fascist buildings. It was called, in fact, the Casa del Popolo in 1961, and my insistence on calling it the Casa del Fascio was not met with great uh, respect or energy in many parts of Italy. Of course, it took someone like Manfredo Tafuri, uh, a, a Marxist at the time, to also begin to write uh, about uh, Taranyi, and in fact, uh, he wrote the introduction uh, to my book 20 years before I actually published my book on the subject and the mask uh, uh, relating the work of Turani to uh, my, my, as it were, Turani. So uh, Turani was a, a, a surrogate, let's say, uh, for myself. It also uh, began a, a career of understanding that uh, precedent was clearly an important uh, part of, of, of being an architect and understanding the, the, prop, the possible use of precedent as invention rather than as history. In other words, using it uh, to conceptualize uh, uh, discourse and also Funnily enough, um, it was to begin to break from Colin Rowe, uh, because Colin, not that he had written about Taranyi, uh, but he had written about Palladio and Le Corbusier, and it was a space to clear for myself, and in fact, Rowe at the time had written me saying that what I was doing on Palladio, for, I mean on Le Corbusier, was the most uh, significant work uh, he had seen done on this uh, particular architect. But it was an attempt to move out of the row orbit uh, that started me on this uh, path. If we jump from 1961 uh, to 1973, 74, 75, and the moment of the realization of, uh, of postmodernist uh, stirrings uh, and uh, the breaking up of the five architects, which uh, began in uh, 73 at the uh, Milan Triennale, uh, where we were invited to show our work by Aldo Rossi, who ran the Milan Triennale of 73. I began to realize that uh, what the postmodernists, and this became quite apparent in 1978 in Roma Interrotta, uh, which uh, took the Noli map of Rome, which became the postmodernist icon, I would argue, par excellence, uh, and uh, took 12 postmodernist architects and uh, deployed them on the 12 uh, parts of the Noli map to produce a uh, postmodern idea of Rome. And what I realized was that uh, the iconography of uh, the Noli map and what uh, the, the postmodernists saw as history was a very different history and a history which avoided Taranyi, Piranesi, Palladio, and even at that time, Alberti. I want to say that this was an avoidance uh, uh, and in favor of a Schinkel, a Lutyens, a, a Sohn, especially Lutyens, who is the darling 
uh, of, of the postmodernists, a person whom even Colin Rowe in his late uh, postmodern turn uh, thought was an inferior architect. And in fact, when uh, I was with Rowe in a tour of English architecture, we never looked at Lutyens or Sohn, we looked at Vanbrugh, Hawksmore, and Butterfield, all of whom uh, came out of uh, uh, a rethinking of Palladio through uh, someone like uh, Christopher Wren. Uh, so that the postmodern idea of history avoided certain characters and it was precisely this avoidance <coughs> That, that, that interested me. Not I was interested in salvation or redemption, but was interested in why uh, postmodernism particularly avoided uh, people like uh, Palladio, uh, people like Piranesi, they, they preferred uh, Nolly's figure ground maps uh, to Piranesi's figure figure maps, and uh, particularly Palladio. Now, I would argue uh, probably uh, uh, not parallel to Paniotis' uh, project, but to say that um, I, I certainly am not interested in De La Familia uh, as, as a work of Alberti. Uh, I, I, I avoid reading uh, De La Familia because I'm really uninterested in the idea of the apartment uh, and the house because uh, the kinds of uh, housing that I do um, uh, deals with the multiple, uh, and I live in a very conventional apartment, which is wonderful in New York City, but it doesn't affect the city so much as the agglomeration of the uh, 21 floors of the building which affect the city. I have designed beautiful apartments in Milan but it's the agglomeration of the apartments, the 75 apartments, that affect the urban uh, fabric. So for me, um, I'm interested uh, not so much in the individual unit. I also did a hotel uh, for the uh, Olympics in Barcelona, which had very nice hotel rooms, but the agglomeration into a hotel was, was quite uh, radical. Uh, one would argue. So uh, for me, I'm very much interested in the instability of clarity. There's no question that for me uh, to think of Palladio as clarity uh, is a misreading because first of all, it is not about ideal geometry. It is about the dissolution of ideal geometry, a dissolution of the center uh, to multiple centers uh, to multiple layers of reading, uh, and in fact, to the dissolution of the house itself. As I uh, have pointed out in my research that uh, several of the people that have followed this research uh, sitting at this table um, understand that the exhibition we did at Yale was about the dissolution of ideality and that, the, that to read Palladio as the epigony uh, uh, of, of, of ideality is, I believe, a misreading. Uh, and of course, since history is only about the value judgments that bring to the supposed facts of history, uh, no one is to say right or wrong. Uh, certainly, it's not about what Palladio thought, uh, but what is interesting about Palladio is he redrew his buildings uh, after uh, 1570, between 1570 and 1580, not the way they were built, but the way he ex wanted them thought about in history. So for me, the four books are far more important uh, in, in one respect than actually uh, visiting uh, all of the uh, built works, who, many of which have been transformed. Of course, one learns to see uh, uh, as I did uh, by going to those built works. It's very hard to learn to see from drawings necessarily, uh, but the, the four books begin to show you the whole idea of the instability 
of the idea of center in the work of Palladio. What's so interesting is Wurflin, Wittkover, Frankel, uh, the German art history uh, on uh, Palladio, which is followed by Colin Rowe, who is very much against uh, what I would call French thought, certainly French post-structural thought, uh, or French linguistics thought after De Saussure, uh, an Englishism uh, that uh, is hard to deal with in its uh, pragmatic uh, phenomenology, let's say, uh, ultimately, but that uh, none of the outbuildings, the Barquese, which are so important to understanding Palladio are ever drawn or talked about in the critiques of uh, Wittkover and his uh, pupil Colin Rowe, which in fact are the measure to me of the, the movement from the object into uh, the landscape and into the, the appropriation uh, of the landscape. So um, the uh, work went from, let's say, from Taranyi through to Palladio, uh, a, a side trip uh, to Piranesi because um, uh, I'm not so much interested in the carchery or the vedute uh, as I am interested in two uh, drawings. One, the Collegio Romano, uh, which is a stunning uh, uh, revelation, let's say, of something which appears to be a complex centralized building, uh, a collegio uh, for obviously the Jesuits and um, the building that is ultimately built in Rome by Amanati, uh, the Collegio Romano. But if you look at the Piranesi drawing and you have your students work on it as I did to build actual models of what is drawn, what seems to be uh, centrifugal or centripetal, either way you want to look at it. In other words, I would say it's centripetal, a movement to the center. And of course, the center is something abhorrent to uh, modern architecture, and which is something very interesting because to think of the center uh, as postmodernists do is to think of the nostalgic center of centers. Whereas if you look at the center in the work of Piranesi or Palladio, you begin to see uh, the instability of this ideal notion of, of center or centrifuge. And if you build uh, the Collegio model, as I have had my students do on many occasions, you cannot reach the center uh, with the means provided by the Palladian plan. That is, uh, no matter which way you run the stairs up or down uh, in the various layers that move from the as a, a centripetal movement to the center, uh, you can never reach the center. Now, clearly, Pal uh, Piranesi was aware of this, uh, and uh, clearly that was the intentionality of something that looked to be a complex uh, centrifuge, which really wasn't. It only appeared that way, uh, but wasn't the case. So we then get uh, to uh, Alberti, and again, perhaps um, I am uh, astonished by the fact that the uh, the phenomenologists uh, are the people Portuguese, Rickwort, and others who have captured that flag. And of course, you have to be careful in these uh, times uh, who has the flag. Uh, in, in, for example, in the United States. The Republicans or the right wing always have the flag, and the Democrats are, are always at a loss in elections uh, to wave the flag because uh, it's always captured by the right. So flags are really very symbolic, and one of the most important flags in architecture is the Albertian flag. And uh, I am very tired of the right wing uh, of architecture to have captured the Albertian flag. And so my energy was purely polemical to begin with. Um, uh, and um, I always was, in, in fact, what's so interesting, on my many occasions with, with Joseph Rickwort, I was used by Colin Rowe as his bulldog, 
uh, in confrontations with Roe, uh, with, with Rickward, he would wind me up and I would go in as the attack dog uh, on Rickward. I never realized what, what was the reason until uh, maybe 30 or 40 years later that in fact Rickward was, along with Portuguese, along with Norbert Schultz, Ioanni Palisma, were the enemy, right? And I also realized that uh, Rickward and these people had captured the Albertian flag, something that was neither right for them to have, nor, there, nor was it uh, in fact invoked by any of their uh, progeny. And so um, uh, I set out uh, most recently to look at Alberti in a, in a very different way and um, to talk about Alberti as that moment in architecture when uh, ground zero, uh, uh, as opposed to Mies and uh, Schenkel and Palladio, that ground zero was set out for all time for all architecture and that ground zero should not be right or left should be uh, in the in the center, and um, I would argue and have argued that all of architecture from the time of Alberti was, if you want, a swerving uh, to produce uh, something outside of the Albertian notion of homogeneous space or part to whole relationships. These, uh, what I would call the in instantiation of metaphysical principles. Uh, have characterized the history of architecture and the theory of architecture from uh, the 15th century, 1460, uh, to the present. And I would uh, argue with uh, Mario Carpo that in fact the digital, uh, in an unconscious, subliminal way, uh, is an attempt to again attack the Albertian uh, moment uh, through producing heterogeneous, uh, inconsistent, what I would call heterogeneous, inconsistent multiples which are possible within the digital. And of course my complaint with the digital is as opposed to producing inconsistent and heterogeny, uh, they produce homogeneous, consistent uh, multiples uh, precisely because of the latent phenomenology that exists in the digital. So that in a, in a sense, my work is a, a, a campaign, let's say, has always seen architecture as a struggle between good and evil, uh, and have always lived uh, in, in that sort of way. Um, and uh, every one of the, the projects that I have done is in a sense, I would argue, exemplary of the trajectory of that struggle uh, and um, has to be seen in that light. So I'm not neutral about the work of Taragni, the work of Palladio, the work of Piranesi or Alberti. I can throw in Luigi Moretti, an arch fascist, uh, and uh, say that there's no question that Moretti, who, who was first read by Peter Rayner Banham uh, and then by Bob Venturi uh, is also read differently by them than the readings that I have done on uh, uh, Moretti. Uh, there's no question that the investigation of precedent, uh, the investigation of the, the notion of diagram as opposed to partie, because Rowe used to always talk about partie, which is a French idea and diagram is a more, uh, let's say, uh, Germanic, if one wants, uh, notion uh, of the way of looking at the world. I always insist, and we will see this uh, in the work that I will show later today, uh, on uh, the fact that you have to have a diagram. You can't just sit down and scribble uh, when you're working. You can't just take uh, functions and, and move them around like uh, men on a chessboard. You ha and you don't play chess unless you have a diagram in mind. It's already a, 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 an idea, a conceptual idea the minute you make the first move in chess. And I believe uh, that 
architecture and, and in fact, the, the, the idea of project has always been about uh, the movement of, of, of metaphorical chess pieces uh, on a board. Um, I think it's a very sacred uh, occupation, the idea of project. I think there are very few architects that have project. Uh, they can project. Uh, there are uh, theorists uh, among us who talk about the projective, which is an anti-Benjaminian, anti-Adornoian, uh, anti-Frankfurt School idea of uh, negative Denken, uh, and that uh, we, we don't need to be negative anymore. Uh, but for me, project uh, has nothing to do with looking forward. Uh, it has to do with a, an attitude toward uh, space and time that uh, is, uh, say, uh, uh, much more uh, akin with uh, post-structuralist uh, thought and uh, linguistic thought than it is uh, with uh, certain aspects of phenomenology. But I don't want to necessarily uh, because then I would be here for another two hours uh, trying to explain what project means in, in, in architecture. But just to say that there is no question that part of project for me is the, the opening up of history to invention, uh, not uh, to history uh, codifying invention, but opening history to invention, which in fact is what, uh, for me, the basic part of project is about. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Eisenman. I think we have 15 to 20 minutes for discussion, and after that I will give five minutes to the questions from the audience. So, is anybody keen to start from the participant? No, I, I, I must say, I, I, this is the best version of all this I've ever heard you. Um, I mean, this was so clear, so incredibly clear. I'm, I, you know, I know that you said, I, I was just going to say, well, how about project? And then you said, I'm not going to talk about project because we will be here for too long. But that would have been uh, my, my question. Uh, how, you know, it seems like, in the way you described it, there are... Uh, them and mm -hmm. you, them, them and others. Them, well, yes, them and others. <laughs> there are others. Yeah. It's not just Jen yes. and me. Okay, them and others, um, and it seems that um, they didn't have a project, or do no, they, they do have, have a, pro a project? Because it seems no, like no, there no. is one type of. They um, do have a project, a very clear political project. Absolutely, please be careful. Um, Many of them, I mean, uh, many of the best uh, have a project. But that, that seems to be a, a different type of project in the sense that it is so ideological that um, yes. it's not even conscious that the project exists, that that, con that, that political project exists. Whereas for you, the, the idea of project is a, a very self-conscious act of approaching the world. Either you, you know well, what you are doing, you have a project, or you just do what, what you feel is the right thing to no, do. No, 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 no. First of all, uh, let's make sure we understand. Aldo Rossi had a project. Uh, in, in his own way, Paolo Portoghese clearly had a project. Uh, a Manfredo Tafuri had a project. Rafael Moneo had a pro has a project. Um, but Adolf Loos had a project. There, there are many people. Greg Lynn has a project. Alejandro Zayarpolo has a project. There are many people, young, small, big, and little, have projects. Uh, but they are such a minority compared to uh, some of the popular names that I have purposely left out who don't have a project, uh, who represent uh, to students and others, uh, s certain hero figures, whether on the left or the right, uh, commercial architects uh, like 
Pardon? Do they have what instead? do they have instead? Commercial success. Into what? A commercial success is, is they with are With what? What? What they are dealing I'm with to I've have commercial success. Uh, <laughs> you clearly are anxious about something. What is it that I... No, no, I mean, do, do you divide practice, architectural practice, as an idea, as term, a commercial success? I didn't say... From, from the project. I'm, I'm saying is... Uh, uh, there's nothing uh, for me conceptual in the work of Norman Foster and Renzo Piano. You want me to go down a list of people who are not animated by concept, all right? Mm -hmm. Now, there are people I'm I oppose, like Robert Venturi, who has a project, who, like Rafael Moneo, who has a project, uh, like Paolo Portuguese, who has a project. But there are equally hundreds of architects. They're all over the place. Uh, Jean Nouvel, uh, Renzo Piano, uh, Norman Foster, Richard Rogers, uh, David Chesterfield, Chesterfield, or whatever. <laughs> uh, uh, you name it. Uh, they have no project. And I'm, I'm challenging everyone here to say that without a project, you cannot come into this auditorium. Uh, or the desire for project. And to me, that's what this conference is about, the, the debate about the possibility of project. It's not about Peter Eisenman. It's the, we talk about the issue uh, concerning the project of Peter Eisenman, not Peter, and I would be here arguing not for Peter Eisenman, but for the concept of project. Uh, and uh, we're deploying the various modes that project can be deployed in. And I have debated people like Chris Alexander, I have debated uh, any number of people uh, like Norman Foster, I mean, I, the, the list of, of people that I've debated and talked with um, is legion. Uh, I'm willing to go to the end of the world to debate people about the issue of project. Uh, because I think, to me, without project, uh, populism reigns. Uh, we have the we have uh, the the death of authorial possibility and 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 the death of really what I consider to be architecture, which to me is fundamental to culture. Without architecture, there is no culture, uh, and it's the most public and and most political, as was said yesterday, of all the arts, and therefore very important. Uh, that we maintain architecture and not turn architecture into a trade school uh, pedagogy. And what worries me is maybe even here in Serbia, uh, that's what's happening because I know that's what's happening in the United States. That kids say, why do we have to study Palladio? We just need BIM mm -hmm. and uh, 3D Studio Max and Revit. Revit's the big thing, you know. We need <laughs> seminars on Revit and sustainability. Well, name me one sustainable building that's architecture, and I will show you junk. Okay? I don't know if I've made myself clear. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Emmanuel. <laughs> what? <laughs> Go ahead. Um, to go no, back I, to feel, I, I, I feel like one could open many cans of worms, but then the room would be full of worms. <laughs> Let's open them. them. Go ahead. Um, can I yeah. just to go back to history? Yeah. Since this is the topic of, of, of the session, and to the problem or the issue of historical precedent. Am I right to recap the cases you have mentioned yeah. in this way? In all the cases of historical precedents you have mentioned, you are not interested in names that follow rules, and you are not interested in names that follow license or irregularity. You are interested in all cases, in cases where you can perceive a dialectic between rule and license, how we can learn what the rule is, so we can, as Emmanuel said, we can show it and deny it. We can find it and contradict it. But 
This pattern of finding and contradicting uh, the rule is never figural. It is always transfigural or transfigurated by diagrams, grids, and other devices of abstraction. Mm -hmm. Can we articulate these two points? Finding the dialectic between rule and license, which we can find, for example, typically in mannerism. Mm -hmm. But Colin Rowe read this dialectic in a figural way, right. whereas you always want to read it in a transfigural way, which is abstract, diagrammatic, and conceptual. Right. Right. Although, to be fair, one of the issues that became important um, one of the issues that puts Le Corbusier uh, way in front of Mies for me is that he was able to produce transfiguration out of figure uh, in the work. In other words, not literal figuration, but the conceptual idea of figure, which Mies never was. So he was abstracting himself? Enough. Right. Yes, which is why he was changing all the time, right. whereas Mies famously right. never, never changed. But um, I, I would argue that what the postmodernists wanted was the return of literal figure. That's why the, the, the phenomenology took over, all right? The literal figuration. And the, the real central issue to me that is a question for all of us is what is the difference between literal figuration and transfiguration, let's say? Literal figuration means what you see yeah. is what you get. get. Right. Transfiguration is what you get is particular and what you do not let's see. see. <laughs> right. Yeah, I should have him around as a sidekick always. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. York, have you got something to add to this discussion? Yes, maybe. I, I would like to ask a question to Peter. You just um, elaborated on the concept of project. How much of the project is historic project? Well, how, you tell me. I would say almost 100 <laughs> Really? Yes. Can you repeat? I would say project is always a project. project. I mean, in other words, would you say the case with Aldo Rossi the same? Um, no, but in, 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 in the way you um, define um, project. project. Because I would not consider his um, history only that which is laid uh, what about is bad. What about Matthias Umbers, who is uh, uh, more to the point? Would you say Matthias Ungers' project is historical? No, maybe it's not a project, it's historical. No, I think Matthias yeah. Ungers has a project. Yeah. I think one of the most <laughs> undervalued, overlooked projects in uh, contemporary thought. Mm -hmm. uh, the buildings he produced were drunk, but the project was interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, um, one interesting thing you, you just mentioned, and I think this is a very important thing, you said, uh, without architecture there is no culture. Yes. I think this is a deeply Albertian thought. What? Because Alberti was the first one somehow who mm -hmm. did away with the, the ontology of architecture, since he clearly stated that architecture is the prerequisite for culture, for civilization. And it's not like uh, Vitruvius, who um, <coughs> tells his stories as the people come together around no. the fire and then they... No, his was a critique of Vitruvius. Yes, absolutely. Yes, it was a total is, critique. This is the thing which was so long repressed also. Right. Yes. Well, so, so wait a minute, wait a minute. I have to ask you a question because you've now said how much of your project is historical. Is too much no good? No, 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 no. no. I'm, I'm just curious. About, I didn't know what the... No, the it's, it's about the concept of rewriting. Yeah, rewriting. Re because rewriting. I don't believe that I know much about history. Yes, yes, yes sure. Yeah. yeah. But the rewriting... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, the thing is, uh, I, I purposely, in other words, Jacques Derrida said to me, you know, you don't understand my writing. 
And I said, I understand very well that you're supposed to misread uh, everything and I misread you uh, because I don't understand that's a good thing. Uh, and so to keep yourself uh, in a way as Colin used to describe me as a noble savage uh, is uh, homme sauvage uh, is I think very important to the understanding of the project. Uh, uh, I think, for example, Greg Lynn uh, has less understanding of history than Zaira Polo because he comes out of the American Midwest, you know, and it, not something that is, it was part of his uh, upbringing. But he has a project, nevertheless, which is a very intriguing one. Uh, I think Pierre Vittorio O'Reilly has a project, uh, a very interesting one, but very different than someone like Greg Lynn, who was trained in the United States, as opposed to O'Reilly, who was trained in Italy. Uh, and um, so uh, I, th I think that um, to say that how much of your project is grounded in history, you could say how much of your project is grounded in misreading history. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. I mean, it's very much in, in the sense um, what I quoted from Goethe. Yeah, you know? yeah. But in a sense, your very same argument when you said that every inflection of the present is an infection of the past, but this is not always true. Because if one does not, I use Peter's okay. categories, yeah, sure. if one does not have a project, then the inflection of the present can only be an infection of the present. Yes. So we should Whereas say to have it an infection be, it has of the to be in order. Yeah. Okay. All right. Inflection, yes. Yes, infection. What, yeah. what was inflection, it? Inflection, infection. Good I mean, point. Peter, you brought up uh, Ungas, and to me, Ungas, in the context of this panel, is important just because he's one of the architects who really talked about Alberti yes. and used him as the, a pretext to define one of his four or five themes of architecture, the theme of incorporation, for the reason that what he picked up from Alberti was the idea that a house is like a small city yeah, and a city is exactly. like a big house, and uh, tried to um, used that idea to generate some of his architecture um, projects that I think you hate, like the German Architecture Museum yeah. or the, his Hotel Berlin. Berlin. Yeah. Um, and um, it seems to me that... But not Enschede, not the project. No, no, that was a collage project. Yeah. Yeah. Or a, uh, yeah. but, uh, but, but it seems to me that the Alberti that Ungas was interested in was the Alberti of... Uh, homogeneity in yes. continuous space. Right. And so uh, if you were to attack somebody who is largely contemporary with your work, it exactly. would have to be Ungers, Ungers. attack. Well, Ungers, but I would still acknowledge the fact that it's a project. I would, I would think that, uh, and, and an interesting project, okay? As I would acknowledge that Venturi's was the first American project uh, post-war, let's say. Uh, in fact, it could be considered if you go back, uh, I don't know when the next American project, I, I don't know if I include Wright as having a project, I'm not certain if Sullivan, Richardson, I mean, they're probably Americans who had projects, but certainly post-war, Venturi was the, was the first. And then Venturi opened the idea of thinking uh, projectually uh, in the book Complexity and Contradiction. And we have to make sure that we realize that Complexity and Contradiction was not a postmodern book, it was the cusp which became in Las Vegas in 72, six years later, postmodernism, which is an entirely different book. Uh, and uh, a book which deploys uh, postmodernist ideology in a way that was different from the theoretical moment of complexity and contradiction. Uh, I would argue that, that, that there's an there's enormous break there. And of course, let's, if we want to introduce the real dark figure, uh, the Darth Vader of, of postmodernism, it has to be Leon Creer. Uh, because uh, there is a man with a fantastic project 
uh, who was the subconscious animator of Jim Sterling, of Michael Graves, of eventually Colin Rowe, of my partner Jack Robertson. He took these people uh, like some mystic and transformed them into uh, the postmodernism that we know because not none of them. Michael was a pure modernist, Sterling was a pure modernist until Darby, uh, and it was Creer uh, who in fact uh, moved them uh, uh, away. Uh, and of course, the relationship between that Darth Vader and Rem Koolhaas is still to be examined because I think that is where a really interesting confrontation would occur in the next generation. I would argue that between Matthias, myself, Venturi is one kind of argument. I think the career uh, Kulhas argument is another. And I think if you come down, uh, there's no question that the Alejandro Zaire, Polo, uh, Pierre Vittorio O'Reilly, who are uh, conf confrontational in the extreme, uh, would be the pair that would elaborate project uh, two, two generations down. Uh, and um, so I think these kind of, of, of dialectical oppositions uh, uh, generate through uh, other generations. You forgot among the victims of that rascal team you mentioned, yes. the one which is likely to be the most ominous one, a prince who may soon become oh, yeah. The prince who soon became, that's right. And then Rasputin, you know what? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Eisman, Mr. Panayotis also has something to say. No, go ahead. No, no, no. We, this is, this is open sesame, you know? Okay. No, I think, I think that uh, there, is, there is a danger, a danger of um, what I mean. Theory, theory is, uh, is a tool. Is, uh, is useful for the architectural project. But uh, history is another tool, is a tool in order to, to compose an ideological project, so to find an identity. And uh, the danger, I think that the danger is that when history becomes theory, the architectural, the architectural transits from philosophy to technology. And uh, the metaphysics becomes product. Do you understand it? I, I heard you. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I don't. I, I would probably ask you, please show me examples of these uh, transformations that you say exist that that uh, moves when theory, when his, when history becomes theory. Architecture becomes uh, technology. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Philosophy becomes technology. I, I don't know how to. That's a very uh, umbrella like concept. Could you give me a specific example yes. of what you mean? The use of, uh, of philosophy and mathematics in the Santa Maria novella of Alberti. And you think that's not architecture? I think that this is uh, a facade uh, with uh, a transcription. That's not very I think that is uh, a mystic language against, uh, against the real role of mathematics. What do you mean by the real role, of as opposed to the unreal? To explain the, 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 the world, to explain the nature, to explain the rules. Um, I, I failed calculus at university, <laughs> and I petitioned out. I was the only architect in the history of the Cornell School of Architecture that graduated without calculus. Um, I, I, I don't think mathematics ever explained anything to me. Uh, I, that's why I, I can't uh, 
is it another metaphysical language? I, uh, I assume yes. Yeah. But your, your commentary is truly Tafurian in the sense that you are saying that if you instrumentalize history the way you say Peter does, um, you turn architecture into a, a technology to produce a certain worldview. Yes. And one can only assume that your implication I mean, I mean, is that there is a danger attached to that as if you want to be Marxist Tafurian. That's what you are yes. saying. Okay. O operative history. Right. Yeah. Oh, I'm not, interested. Not operative theory. Operative history. Right. Yes. That's what we all do. Right? Yes, we all do that. Yes. And even Tafuri did. Okay. It's important to know it. <laughs> no, it's important to know it. But I don't, I mean, if, if you're saying, Peter, are you uh, using subterfuge? Now, I'm very clear about what I do. You can disagree with it. I didn't say it was right or wrong. It's oh, I get up in the morning and do. Uh, but um, I I can understand. Look, understanding Common Row as I did was very important. Watching Common Row, in a sense, <coughs> transform himself. He, he hated modernism. Okay, he hated French thought. And the one way that I could escape from him is to move toward post-structuralism, first through French structuralism, through Lévi-Strauss, uh, Foucault, Roland Barthes, and others, right? The minute I started reading that stuff, Roe was done with me, okay? Uh, and uh, then I became a, a, the idea of the zeitgeist, because this French thought was not de Tocqueville and Taine. And Conan Rowe's idea of French thought was de Tocqueville and Taine, who couldn't be more on the right, let's say. A, a kind of Tory view of history was Rowe's. Edmund Burke was his philosopher of choice. And, you know, if you understand, Conan had a great vision, but his polit politics, for me, were problematic, all right? And so to escape from the, this uh, conservative politics, uh, one moved to France, and of course this is where he could never go, okay? Um, uh, because he was too English to be able to do that. Uh, and, what? But the, I mean, I find the question a very good one because it is a paradox that I, uh, in yeah. your work and in your dialogue with Tafuri, I, I don't find resolved. Uh, I think for you it is very convenient that Tafuri is dead because that, so that you can appropriate him and take the Marxism away and just keep the autonomy. Um, because you cannot in the same conference say, like you did yesterday, that uh, autonomy is the most political project in architecture there is, which right. I am ready to agree with, and then give as an answer to this question that you are a good boy because you don't kill anybody. Right? That although your project uh, is so radical and so destabilizing, ultimately you are not responsible for the death of people. Um, and therefore, your, your way, the, the fact that you might, uh, you know, deal with operative, have your own version of operative history, is ultimately not dangerous. And that I find very problematic because that was, in fact. I didn't say that. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> I mean, clearly there are two versions of, at least two versions that have been very visible of autonomy in architecture since the 1970s. One is right. the Tafurian one, one is uh, the, the, the former one, uh, yeah. which is, yours, which is With political. The session, it was an important point. We use the same term defined two different things. One which has a political implication, that's the Italian way, and one which is a formalist implication, that's the Colin Rowe and later American way. The term is the same, but we should, you know, use this term to disambiguate autonomy one and autonomy two. Otherwise we will never understand what you're talking about. Can I do a proposal? Can I propose to, to pass to next session because uh, there will be a a very strong Italian touch in the next session. So, as, there, as now there are too much 
important issues that you are discussing all together, to me, they are too much at the, at the moment. You can say Criere and Colas, Zerabone, Pervito, Tafuro, Operative History, Bruno Zevi, who is, who is fundamental, fundamental. So I, I propose to, to go... To go, because it's really too much, it's really a dish free or with <laughs> four or five uh, okay, dishes all together, <laughs> so I don't for know. Forgive me, forgive me, I know we were late this morning and now we have only four minutes for a very, very short break and then uh, in the next session I will leave maybe to another moderator to ask earlier questions from the audience. So, all panelists, I want to thank you very much. It was very interesting to me being here with you. <laughs> thank you. I thought it was good. Yeah, I'm not.